Hey guys, OG Albina here, bringing you guys Draft Notes Week 3 for the SPL. This is the show that has everything and anything SPL you might want to see covered. If you guys are excited for this week, be sure to drop a like as well as subscribe to the channel. We are on our way to 3,000 subscribers. And if everybody who watches this video today hits that sub button, we should get there. So I would really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, with that being said, we got a lot of fun games to go over, a lot of matchups to look at. And uh, yeah, let's jump into it. Alrighty guys, first up let's go over last week's games and how they went, how everything went down. First up we have Thomas versus Vivid, where Thomas took home a nice 3-0 dub against Vivid on the back of Azumarill going absolutely insane this matchup. It matched up well both defensively and offensively into a ton of Vivid's offense. It was really hard for him to break it and switch into it, so Thomas was able to position it very well, put on a ton of offensive pressure with it. Next up was Joey versus Leo here in a game where both coaches were looking to get their first win of the season. Joey was able to do so on the back of a very bulky Torterra that was shell smashed but didn't ever really find the position to do so. It just kind of came in, clicked buttons, was really annoying with that electric typing once it teared, and uh, yeah, was able to take home a dub for him. Then we have MV versus Viz, a really, really exciting matchup, one that I was looking forward to in particular. Both coaches coming off a very convincing win in week one. MV was able to take home the dub here, mostly on the back of that Espeon with the Terra Fairy, Key Berry, and Reflect, not dying to any physical hits, and especially not dying to any special hits once it started call mining up. It put a ton of pressure on Viz's team where he was able to eventually force it low and force it out, but at that point, I think the team had just, you know, taken way too much damage to that Espeon, and MV was able to take home a W. Then we have Seabed versus Druby in another really, really close game. Personally, my favorite game of the week, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Druby able to take home a narrow 1-0 victory here in this one, an absolute nail biter, where Pokemon like Arcanine were able to put on a ton of offensive pressure. At the same time, Pokemon like Iron Bundle on Seabed side were also able to put on a ton of offensive pressure. It was a really, really back and forth game, and it came down to positioning and just having the right sacks, and Druby was able to do so pretty well. So definitely a really fun one to watch. Then we have Uzi versus Nexus, and another really, really, really close one. I know the score was 2-0, but man, if that Gardevoir didn't get that vacuum wave in this uh, new recent DLC and wasn't running it, I think Nexus actually positioned himself pretty well. He was able to make some great, great aggressive reads, but Uzi was able to secure a Gardevoir endgame and positioned very, very nicely around it and was able to really, really play well this game, um, really, really earning that 2-0 victory. Then we had probably the biggest score gap of the week, not probably, the biggest score gap of the week, with Kyle beating uh, the Saint, oh my gosh, I almost said St. Louis Stunkies, just because they all both start with S, the Philadelphia Stunkies in Shuckle King 5-0 on the back of Noctowl, we will talk about it a little bit more later on, but Kyle bringing the heat again this week, and this week it ended up working out and getting them a 5-0 dub. Then lastly, we have Mephesto versus its Danny Mac. And Mephesto really, really was able to show off the Sand Spit Sandaconda and really control the weather game, which is important because I think he recognized in the builder that he didn't have much for Sun. A lot of Danny's Sun offense super, super overwhelmed him on team preview. So having that way of resetting said Sun um, and getting up a ton of hazards, really chipping things down and really being able to control that really put him in a great spot and uh, he was able to take home only a 2-0 victory but it was a very convincing 2-0 victory he was in the driver's seat the whole time and uh, yeah with that being said let's jump on to some cool sets and some cool plays from the week First up, of course, we gotta talk about the Noctowl. Now, last week in SPL Draft Notes Week 2, I'm sure some of you guys remember, I was kind of gassing up Shuckle's matchup a little bit. I thought he had an incredible matchup with the Enamors. The only fairy resist on Kyle's team being the Colossal and the Reverend, which both get blown up by a stray Earth power. But Kyle was able to prove, hey, Noctowl goes crazy. And actually, fun fact, I had someone reach out to me in Discord and say, hey, man, I think you're kind of sleeping on Noctowl this week. I think it's going to do really, really well into um, Shuckle's team. And they were right. They proved me wrong, man. Shy with this, Kyle with this sub calm mind Noctowl went absolutely crazy. Uh, picking up a ton of kills and grabbing himself a really, really convincing 5-0 victory with some really, really great prep. So, shouts to Kyle for that. Another game full of really, really heat sets is Viz vs. MV. Viz bought some really, really wonky stuff as well. I think he had like a max special defense, um, rest talking, Eviolite Basculin, which was definitely pretty fun to see. It was eating up some hits for sure. But MV obviously able to put on a ton of pressure with his Key Berry, Calm Mind, Reflect, 
Espeon really, really wearing down um, Viz's team. Able to get up a ton of boosts and throw off really strong Terra Booster Draining Kisses to keep itself healthy and store powers to break through Pokemon that would conventionally check you, like a Corviknight or something of the sorts. Um, it didn't end up winning on its own because Viz was able to pressure enough to keep it very low because of the fact that it didn't have, you know, a Morning Sun as a recovery option. But by that point, SVN had already kind of done its work and done a ton of damage to where the rest of Envy's team could clean up pretty uh, pretty handily. Things like the AV Ursaluna Blood Moon and things like that were able to form really well. Um, so yeah, really, really good uh, prep on Envy's part and a really, really fun match to watch. And next up, by request, we are going to have the game of the week. For this week, for me personally, it was Seabad versus Ruby. This is the game I enjoyed watching the most. An absolute nail biter coming down 1 0 in this one in favor of Ruby. There were just a couple things on each side that end up kind of swaying the momentum of the battle. Arcanine was able to put on a ridiculous amount of pressure, and I actually think that was due to the Dawn fan taking some early hits that it wasn't really expected to do so. Um, and once that happened, Arcanine could kind of come in and pick one off every single time. But it wasn't scarf so this game really did come down to the uh you know very very end here because there were things that could prevent it like the iron bundle and things of the sort so uh, definitely a really really fun one to watch i really enjoyed this game a ton both coaches played very very well um, it just came down to who had the most sacks and who could position their offense better in the end and Druby was able to just barely pull it out uh, but very good game to both coaches it was a ton of fun to watch and then really quick, I completely forgot to mention it once again, but you can see in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, our Pick'em score for the season. We went three and four again this week. I was uh, unfortunately not able to break over that 500 mark. That is my end of the season goal, is to get to 500 or above 500 on Pick'ems. Um, unfortunately, we fall a little bit more behind again this week, but three and four isn't too bad. Um, we just need to rattle off a good couple of weeks and we can totally start you know, getting up there. Uh, but six and eight right now, not too bad, but not what we're looking for. Let's go ahead and look into next week's matchups and get our pickums going for that. Our first matchup of the week is going to be the Los Angeles Wakers, coached by Joey Pokeham against the Miami Don fan by Kyle A. Now, the biggest takeaway in this matchup for me personally is going to be that Clefable. When you're going up against Veil offense, a ton of setup, and a ton of physical offense at that, something like an unaware Clef is going to be extremely, extremely important. I really do think that like a boots physically defensive unaware set is almost a requirement in this game here from Joey. Checking the likes of the Roaring Moon, checking the likes of the Bear Tick, which really do do him dirty otherwise. Even checking the likes of the Water Bowl, which can be very, very strong in this matchup. And even some Rillaboom variants, I think Choice Band Woodhammer is still going to 2 it KO, two it KO you. Um, but other than that, it does do, you know, a pretty decent job at checking most Rillaboom variants, especially Swords Dance variants. On top of that, something like Heatran is also going to be very solid against the special attackers of this team. Things like the Knock Tower, it's going to take a lot of boost for that thing to break past the um, Heatran, even with the Tinted Lens. Then we also have Pokemon like Ninetales, obviously, Hisui and Zoroark. They aren't really going to appreciate trying to break down Heatran. Heatran's going to be a great rocker. It's probably going to Magma Storm things down, really wear them down, which is really, really solid. And if it is a Wish Clef, keeping itself and Heatran healthy is going to be very important. Pult is very strong here as always, especially due to the fact that it has Infiltrator, meaning that it will not care about that Aurora Veil going up, and it will really be able to break down a lot of Kyle's team very, very well. When they don't have the luxury of, you know, having both a light screen or a reflect up at the same time, they have to just take the full brunt of the Pult's, uh, you know, attacks. It's going to be very, very scary. Really, the only switch in a Pult as well is going to be something like Noctowl, um, just because it is pretty darn specially defensive, has good reliable recovery, but other than that, Kyle really does not have a great pit switch into the Dragapult, and then Quackleball also has great snowball potential in this matchup. Once the Rillaboom is gone, it can absolutely cleave through a team like this. Water Bowl can also soft check it as well as Mew, but neither of those Pokemon have recovery anymore, so once Quack gets rolling, it can go pretty crazy. It can also spin away hazards. It can even brick break away screen if it really needs to. So yeah, overall, does really well. And there's obviously other Pokemon in the matchup that do very, very solid. Pokemon like Thundee, Pokemon like Overquill. Um, even an Azelf has a place here, in my opinion, because the dark type isn't something that's going to want to switch in on Azelf. So definitely think Joey has a lot of options here. Now, from Kyle's side, Rilla is huge here, revenging a lot of things on Joey's team. Most notably going to be the Quack of All. Like I said, I think that Pokemon can super snowball and get out of control if we do not have a healthy Rillaboom to come in. It doesn't even need to be healthy. It just needs to make sure they can come in and click Grassy Glide. 
It also checks Torterra pretty decently. All of uh, Joey's Terra types don't really break through a pretty defensive bulky Rillaboom. And uh, you can go ahead and Grassy Glide through that thing, especially when it starts dropping its defenses if it does want to be a Shell Smash variant. It also revenges Pokemon like Azelf. It also revenges Pokemon like... Yeah, that's it. You can also go pretty fast and, you know, hit the Heatran with a high horsepower. Which can always be very, very nice and spread knockoffs and be a big nuisance that way. So, while Rillaboom has potential offensively, I think that a more defensive Rillaboom is actually going to be really clutchy for Kyle. Now, the next most important Pokemon for Kyle, in my opinion, is going to be Mew. It has a ton of awesome sets that I can run here, but the two that I think are most likely, or the two that I think do the best, right? Number one is going to be a trapping set, which seems weird, but something like a Sand Tomb or a Fire Spin. I think Sand Tomb because it hits Heatran. Like a sand, sand Tomb Taunt set to really break down and whittle down one of those defensive walls in either Heatran or Clefable. It would be incredibly, incredibly nice. If this thing can remove the Clefable, I think that Kyle's matchup goes from disadvantageous to very, very good if we can get rid of that thing immediately, right? So that's an option. Or another very, very likely option, something I think is more noticeable in prep, is like an offensive mute. And I'm not even saying setup because, like I said, the Clefable is sitting right there, but like. A four attack life orb or expert belt set, whether it be physical, special, or mix, does very, very well here. I would probably lean special. Psychic Earth Power Sludge Bomb hits like everything really, really hard. And then you could tech on either like a Dazzling Gleam or an Ice Beam or something of the sorts. And you're going to hit a lot of things very, very hard. There's not a lot of things on this team that are going to want to switch into you consistently. You can even tech on some kind of priority option, like a vacuum wave if like the torque gets weakened, but probably not. Realistically, I don't think that's the uh, the best case. Or even just a random taunt to make sure that the clef can't heal up after you hit it with a really strong life orb sludge bomb. Um, or even like the Torterra can't set up, or the Heatran can't set up rocks, or the Overcoil can't set up spikes, or whatever it may be. I think like a taunt three attacks or a four attacks Mew could be really, really strong here. Um, and yeah, if, like I was saying though, sorry, kind of stumbled over my words a little bit. I think if the clef is removed or broken down in some way to where that Roaring Moon or that Terra Electric Bear Tick can come in, I think that Kyle can really flip this matchup, but I think it is very contingent on clef going down. So if Joey plays the clef right, I do think that he wins this game, and I am going to take Joey in any slight margin in this matchup. Alrighty, our next matchup is going to be Thomas and his Copenhagen Glades, I believe the team name is, and Drewby and his New York Marauders. Now, on Thomas' side, some things to note. I think that Azu does very, very well in soft checking a lot of this team. Things like the Arcanine and the Mens, it is always going to threaten out. It also checks things like low kicks, always pressures out the, uh, you know, the uh, Iron Treads. It really does hit this team pretty darn hard with just its stabs plus knockoff plus Aqua Jet. Um, so I think that that Pokemon is going to be very, very important in this game. I think Glow King is a bit annoying for Drooby to pivot into. Uh, I think some kind of like offensive trick room type set or even just a phys physically defensive variant with like a future sight sludge bomb, surf, maybe ice beam as the last move can do really, really well in this matchup. And it's going to be really obnoxious for Drooby to pivot around. And then on top of that is Vexcalibur. Now, Orthworm does check it very well, right? It checks it very, very well. But once that Orthworm is whittled down or taken out of the game, I think that Bats can really go to town. Maybe a Choice Band variant to break for itself, because nothing wants to take a Choice Band Glaive Rush on this team, right? The Fairy is going to be something like Pheasantipity, which is going to get blown up by any type of Icicle Crash or Spear or even a random Earthquake, which you're probably not going to run in this game when Orthworms is the most likely pivot, but... Regardless, it's not going to take an ice move, if that makes any sense. And other than that, you can kind of just click Glaive Rush against the entirety of this team and do a ton of damage. Orthworm can take it, but it doesn't have any reliable recovery, so it's really only a one-time check to a Choice Band set, depending on what it wants to click. On top of that, I think Raichu is also very good here. If you think, look at its uh, coverage options of just really electric plus water, it hits Drewby's team incredibly, incredibly hard. And he doesn't deal with it all too well outside of like maybe a spit of fez um an av iron treads could be a good pivot into it um and really that's about it i mean i think it does really really well here it's very strong which is pretty fun to say for a raichu um now it's not the most naturally strong pokemon in the world so you can kind of like just naturally outstab it a lot of the times but i think it is something to keep in mind now from Drewby's side oh my goodness look at the ogre pond water matchup it goes insane. Um, the combination of just dual stabs plus U-turn 
plus play rough uh just goes absolutely insane here um play rough slash i think low kick it gets um as well or at least some kind of fighting coverage you know it gets either of those really work um and you're able to kind of just grab momentum for yourself really break through this team a ton i think an offensive set would do really really well here um just kind of clicking its dual stabs and you turning around when disadvantageous matchups and pokemon come in it's not like your water and grass resistance Zerud is going to be able to come in and take a u-turn afterwards so if you can get up apt hazards really just rocks and maybe spikes from your orthworm you just kind of click ivy cudgel throughout the whole game and prosper i don't see there's like there's much uh counterplay here on thomas's team iron chest does really well as well we kind of mentioned it before but i think assault vest would be a very solid shout or even a sugarberry variant you know to switch into that Bax, another pokemon that can kind of do so uh which would obviously be you know pretty solid if orth doesn't come but I think Orthworm really should come. I think it's great here, man. Um, it walls Gliscor. Now, you can't do much back to Gliscor, but it walls Gliscor. It checks things like the um, Zarud. It checks the heck out of Bax. Um, and it does really, really well here. It checks the um, Alolan Sand Slash as well if Thomas wants to go the sa or the uh, Hail Route. I almost said Sail Route. Um, so I think that's obviously a really cool option here. And then Slow King and Orthworm just make a really solid defensive core. Um, especially defensive Slow King plus physically defensive Orthworm do really well here. Now, obviously, Orthworm does get whittled and chip down but if it can kind of just stick around for just a little bit maybe you go resto chesto variant maybe you even go rest talk and you go full send into orthworm being here for the whole game and not setting up hazards i think that you can do really really well here um on top of your other offensive pieces like a low kicks which can do really really well here arcanine um salamence things like that i think that Druby does have this matchup in my opinion so i am going to go for him pretty much on the back of this ogre pond water that goes absolutely insane here Next up, we have Envy versus Mephesto, and the first thing we have to mention here is going to be that Blood Moon, man. Look at this thing and look at Mephesto's team. The combination of Blood Moon plus Earth Power hits the entirety of the team ridiculously hard. Your last two move slots can either be like Moonlight and Calm Mind to set up and try to win the game and just outbulk everything, or you can even go with Hyper Voice over like a Calm Mind, right? or even over a uh, Moonlight if you feel like you don't need to, you know, keep the uh, Blood Moon healthy. Just in case there are Protect Pokemon, like something like a Protect Zapdos could be really, really obnoxious for something like Blood Moon because if you're Mono Blood Moon to hit it, then you can't hit it every other turn because it's going to protect. Now you can't take advantage of that and make some aggressive switches, but I feel like having a way of hitting it if it is a Protect variant is going to be very, very nice, obviously. I think it also could totally run a Choppleberry variant um, just because a lot of the moves that are going to try and revenge it or really do any damage to it are going to be fighting coverage from things like Cinderace, from things like Scizor Close Combat, from things like the Gengar Focus Blast. If you can live a hit from all of the offense, you're going to put yourself in a good spot against Mephesto's team. G Weezing also feels very, very important. It switches really well into Samrot, and it also defogs away those spikes, and those spikes look very, very potent and strong against Envy's team. So I think he is going to need to bring Galarian Weezing and need it to be a defogger in order to have a lot of success in this matchup. And then Manaphy also looks incredibly strong. I think Tail Glow is probably going to be the best set this week with Surf, Ice Beam, and then um, some kind of other coverage move, whether it be like a Dazzling Gleam or an Energy Ball or something like that. But item-wise, I could totally see it being some kind of resist berry, like Rindo or Wakan, just to take those hits from like maybe a Yachi or Scarf um, Serena, or even a potential, you know, Thunderbolt from Zapdos if you're taking Wakan. Or you could even run some kind of interesting Salak Berry set if you think you can't get low enough to proc it. The only issue is there's a lot of priority on Mephesto's team, so I don't think that's really going to be the route he wants to go. Uh, I think some kind of resist berry with just Tail Glow does really, really well in this matchup alongside all of your momentum, the breaking that Ursula Blood Moon can do, um, and, you know, potential hazards from your side and things like that. The Dunsparce also looks really strong as well. I know we kind of mentioned Blood Moon, but I think the Double Normal could be very, very viable. Maybe you let the Dunsparce be that more defensive uh, counterplay to something like Gengar, so you can just click buttons with Blood Moon. Um, or maybe you go Calm Mind on both and really just try to overwhelm checks. I think Calm Mind to Dun with, again, Chopple could also be very strong here, depending on uh, Mephesto's team and what he wants to bring. Now, from Mephesto's side, he has some really scary offensive pieces as well. Banded Cinderace goes absolutely insane if it hits its Pyro Balls. Your switch-in is going to be something like Manaphy, which does not want to take a Choice Band Libero U-turn at all. Um, it really almost puts it into a KO range after that, even if it's like a defensive variant, which is something like scary to note. Um, Scizor also does really well, likewise, with Bolt Punch, U-turn, and CC. Last move can be a knockoff. It can be um, Swords Dance if it really wants to be. 
really the bug, um, steel, and fighting combination hits Envy's team very hard, as it hits most teams hard, but it hits most teams very hard. Zapdos is kind of a requirement for the Sneasler, and in general, I think that Zapdos, um, being more physically offensive and then, like, especially defensive floor, just is going to be a very solid defensive core here for Mephesto. Gengar can also be situationally strong as a, like, T-spiking variant, because if that, uh, Weezing is either Levitate or if it wants to, you know, come in and absorb that T-Spike and the Gengar's on the field, Gengar's going to bully the Weezing unless it's like a random Psybeam set. Um, and I actually don't know if it still gets that. That might be like a regular coughing from early gen move that it could run in Gen 8, but not Gen 9. But regardless, it doesn't beat Gengar, right? Um, so having that T-Spike option to really whittle things down could be really solid. Obviously Sneezer as well, but I could totally see Envy leaving Sneezer on the bench. If it comes, it's just going to be a U-turn bot, probably with protective pads to kind of avoid statics from the Zapdos, because uh, it doesn't do protective particularly insane in this game with things like the um Sandaconda, Zapdos, Scizor, um, and things like that. And even Gengar, which just naturally eats up its stats, so it's interesting. Now, I do think that Mephesto's Terramons look really bad here, which is another unfortunate, you know, byproduct of this. Something like Espeon can really do well for uh, Envy, whereas I don't think that his Terramons are particularly great, at least when they're tearing. Um, I don't think they really help out with a ton <laughs> in this matchup in particular. I am going to lean Envy in this matchup just because I think that the combination of his double normal supposed Manaphy is very overwhelming for Mephesto, but I do think that there is an angle where Mephesto wins this game with Cinderace plus Scizor um, doing really, really well here. Next up, we have Nexus versus Leo in a very hype matchup. And again, we got to shout out the, you know, very, very obvious Iron Moth goes crazy here. It just doesn't have counterplay. I think a choice specs variant from Nexus absolutely massacres Leo. The combination of Sludge Wave, um, Overheat slash Flamethrower, Fiery Dance, whatever fire move you want to go for, probably Overheat just to kill something every single time, plus like Energy Ball goes insane here. It, it just simply does not have counterplay in this matchup. If you take that in combination with uh, the Ogre Pond Cornerstone, which one, looks very solid on its own right, but two, it switches, they don't deal with Moth. Something like Tinkaton or Magneton, which are probably going to more than likely be a pivot in. Uh, mostly Tinkaton, uh, not Magneton, because I don't think Magneton is very good as pivot, actually, to be fair. Um, but the Tinkaton comes in, it gets you turned on, Moth comes in, overheat. Overheat, overheat, overheat. You Oko thick fat mammos with an AV um, with like rocks up with this moth. I think it has an absolutely insane matchup. Another Pokemon that grabs free Volt Switches and free Moth Switches is going to be a Terra Ice Hisuian Electrode. Really anything that pivots in on it is going to get blown up by the Iron Moth. Everything in, in its own right, it does very well. Ice plus electric plus grass just doesn't have consistent counterplay. And I think that Nexus can really take advantage of Leo's team by grabbing constant momentum into this Iron Moth and clicking buttons. Now, booster speed or a choice Scarf Valiant also seems very, very nice here because one, it outpaces like a Scarf Infernape, it outpaces Torn then, but most of all, it's going to allow it to outpace a plus one Haxorus, which looks very, very threatening against this team, which we'll talk about here in a second. And then I think the Hippo plus Alomomola Alom, Al, Alomomola core does really, really well here. I'm checking a ton of Leo's offense. Now, from Leo's side, speaking of the Allo, Mamoswine eats everything alive on Nexus's team outside of the Allo. But even then, if that uh, Allo gets knocked off, it loses like its helmet or its leftovers or its boots. Next time it comes in, if it takes rocks, into Earthquake, it gets too KO'd by the next Earthquake, especially if Sand is up because of Leo's, or because of Nexus's Hippowdon. So I think Mamoswine looks incredibly, incredibly strong. It revenges a ton of this team. It's very, very powerful here. I think a Life Orb variant is really, really likely to put in a ton of work. I also think the combination of Torn and Infernape is very overwhelming for Nexus's defensive core. I think a Nasty Plot Infernape, as well as a Nasty Plot Torn, especially do really well here. If you look at Nasty Plot Torn, I mean, what deals with this thing? With just like Hurricane, Heat Wave, Grass Knot. There's not much on Nexus's team that can ever even think about taking that on. And Infernape is also going to look strong, likewise, with a Nasty Plot variant or something of the sorts. Uh, really, really able to do a ton of damage to this team, outspeed a ton, and really, really pressure it a lot. Now, something like the Iron Moth can always come in and revenge you, not really care about your special attacks, but I don't think that Nexus is really going to want to bring his Iron Moth hard in on Infernape um, at the risk of getting blown up by a physical attack. Or you can even go like a Life Orb variant, some kind of mixed variant could be very, very strong here from the Infernape. 
On top of that, I think he has probably the best Valiant check, non-Terra Valiant check in the game in Screamtail. Some kind of boots Screamtail can be very strong at checking both Valiant as well as something like the Hisuian Electrode here, which is really, really nice. I think a really fast Thunderweaving variant is clutch because you can even outspeed something like an Iron Moth and in a worst case scenario, be like, nope, I need this thing paired. It's killing everything on my team. Hit it with a T-Wave and go from there. Um, so really that might be your best counterplay against the Moth, to be honest. And then Hatcher seems like the best overall win con from Leo's side. He can go very, very bulky if he's aggressive with his creeps. Um, if he's like creeping, electrode creeping the Torn, he can go very, very fat on the Haxorus, get up a Dragon Dance, pretty much live anyone hit from anything not named Valiant, and really go to town and do some work. Now, things like the Aloe and the Hippo need to be chipped, but I think Mamo and Fernet Torn can kind of do that to where your Haxorus can come in and win the game later. Then you have Screamtail, plus probably a Tinkaton or even a Spadef Braviary, which sounds uh, pretty fun. Funny, but it checks non uh, choice specs Iron Moth really, really well. Um, now, obviously, I think specs is going to be the best set for Nexus to run here, but if it's not, then the Bravier does check it well. So, something to keep in mind. I am going to take Nexus in this matchup because I don't think I've seen a better Iron Moth matchup in my life, and I think it's going to do really, really well here. All right, next up we have Shuggle King versus Seabag. Both coaches looking to bounce back from a week two loss from Shuckle side. I think that Garchomp here is going to take a more of a support role um, to where you'd typically see it take a more offensive role in draft league. I think like a special attacking spiking set with Rocky Helmet could be very solid here. The reason I say special attacking is because conventional switch-ins like the Dawn fan, if they come in and take a Draco Meteor, they're not really going to appreciate it. That's really, really nice for um, Shuckle's team in particular because it's also going to be the spinner and the hazard control in this game. And if you can get up spikes against his team, I think that's going to be the best way for him to force progress because otherwise his offense doesn't look particularly insane here. I also think that the Rocky Helmet Chomp can be a very good Ogre Pond check if we get up rocks slash spikes and we're chipping with Ruskin slash Rocky Helmet every time it attacks. It's gonna get whittled pretty darn fast, which is really, really cool, obviously. I think that Meow Scrata is going to be his best way of forcing progress and doing a lot of damage. Some kind of choice band variant can be very strong. Really, the only check is going to be something like a Clef Key, and if we can break open that um, to where something like our Namers can go crazy, then that's obviously going to be very, very nice, or even our Monkey Dory. I also think that the defensive core of Bronzong Umbreon looks strong, as per usual, and something like Basket Legion can also be very strong as well. I mean, some kind of Choice Specs variant, maybe even an Assault Vest variant to, you know, take a bundle hit and kind of revenge it really easily, and uh, even take like a Hydreigon hit and hit it with a strong, strong Ice Beam. All those things seem very, very viable. And this might even be the week to get Bramble off the bench. If we can keep up hazards, spikes, and rocks against Seabed's team and spin block against the Dawn fan, I think that that's going to allow us to really, really um, break down his team a little bit quicker. Whereas, again, otherwise, I don't think we have the best defensive match or offensive matchup in the world. But at the same time, Bramble Gas is pretty bad here other than just spin blocking, right? It kind of loses to everything on Seabed team, so I probably wouldn't bring it, but it's at least something to keep in mind and maybe just test during like, you know, mocks and building and things like that, if Bramble is gonna be worth it. Now, from Seabed's side, I do think that there's a couple Pokemon that look very strong. Something like the Ogre Pond is always gonna be very powerful in this matchup, right? Um, it's dual steps plus play rough is going to hit the entirety of the team very, very hard. Um, and really only the Garchomp is going to be here and around to check it. So that's something to keep in mind. If that thing takes really any chip at all, the Ogre Pond gets crazy, crazy strong and kills something every single time it comes in if it's like a Sword Stance variant, which is obviously something cool to mention. I think a physically defensive Umbreon could take it on and or take a hit at plus two and foul play and knock it out. Um, but other than that, doesn't really appreciate much. Hydreigon and Bundle are also going to be very strong. I think Hydra in particular is pretty darn strong. I'm um, grabbing pretty free U-turns. And then the Raichu, I think in particular, goes crazy. I think Overpomp plus Raichu is really, really difficult for Shuckle to try and potentially deal with. I think like a Terra Fairy Raichu under the terrain, it gets up a nasty plot. And oh man, like what, what happens? <laughs> what do we do? We now resist Sucker Punch. We now hit the Garchomp really hard. We can kind of blow through everything on this team with Electric plus Fairy. There's not really anything that takes it on. If we get up a nasty plot, there's not much that we can do, like I said. Um, and if the uh, terrain isn't up, the only thing that really revenges outside of Scarfers is going to be something like Meow Scarada. You outpace everything else otherwise, and you resist all relevant forms of priority outside of Shadow Sneak from Bramble Gas once you Terra Fairy, which I think is really, really clutch. I think that 
plus hazards is really going to be overwhelming for the potential Halucha endgame. I think Encore Bundle also really is solid in this game and kind of punishing a lot of the fatter things, the more passive things on Chuckles' team. Because while the Bronzong on Brand is very strong defensively, um, it can kind of be exploited a little bit. So that's something to keep in mind here. When looking at this matchup, I am going to take Seabad in a slight margin just because I think that Shuckle struggles breaking through Seabad. Um, a little bit more than Seabad struggles breaking through Shuckle's defensive core and things like that. And I think he can um, overwhelm him and put a lot of pressure on early to where something like either the Raichu or the Halusha can win later in the game with Pink Hershen, um, you know, electric terrain support, that is. So, yeah, I definitely think it's going to be just a little bit in Seabad's favor. Next up, we have Uzi versus Danny. From Danny's side, I think a really, really strong Pokemon, which hasn't really been able to shine so far this season, is going to be the Okie Dogie. I think some kind of four attacks or either AV variant uh, or some kind of resist berry looks really, really strong. I'd personally go AV for a lot of, you know, Uzi special attackers, so you'll naturally be able to check now things like the Shaman, things like the Kilowattro, you'll be able to take a hit from them and revenge them, as well as the Dragology, which is really nice. But there is one good check to it in this matchup in the Great Tusk. But one, Great Tusk is really good against you uh, offensively. So forcing it defensive or forcing damage on it is going to be great. And even as a defensive check, if that thing gets toxic chained, it's really going to be worn down very, very fast. And I think that's actually really valuable for Danny because we'll talk about it in a second, but holy moly, this, this dude's ground resist is a shiftry. So like, I feel like I would take the damage on the tusk. I also think that some kind of like mixed Charizard could be cool. It could even still be like minus attack, but like Earthquake for Jagalji and then just kind of button clicker otherwise. It goes absolutely insane here and does not have good switch ins under Sun. So I think some kind of, you know, really strong breaking Charizard could go absolutely crazy in this matchup. And then the combo of Lycanroc Okie Dogie is also really strong here. Um, just because, again, main test check those things is going to be something like a great tusk. But if we're whittling both of them down with, you know, one or the other, we should be able to break for each other. And I think like Okie breaking for Lycanroc is going to be really solid here because Lycanroc outside of the great tusk looks absolutely insane in this matchup. Now, over to Uzi's side. We've been talking about great tusks from Dandy's side, but man, from Uzi's side, holy moly, this thing is insane. It does have great defensive application in this game, like I said, checking things like Lycanroc, checking things like Okie Dogie. Um, but offensively, oh my god, especially if Sun comes, I'm running Scarf Tusk and I'm killing everything. The ground resist on this team is going to be Shiftry, and the immunities are not good right? They're just not very good. Um, they're stone edge away from getting absolutely blown up, especially if we're getting that booster attack. And I really do think that a Scarf Bank could go absolutely insane in this matchup. You gotta be careful about pivoting into Oki, though, because you don't want to get knocked off. Even then, this Pokemon looks very, very powerful in this matchup. Now, if one offensive ground does well, how does the other one do? Well, very, very well. We have Ursaluna, which can even serve as, like, the breaker or something like Great Tusk, if we come in with like some kind of Flame Orb variant with just like Facade, Earthquake slash Headlong, and then Crunch or Ice Punch or whatever coverage move you really want to run, oh my god, like it, it just kills something every time it comes in if it's positioned well. Now it does chip itself down with its own Flame Orb, and there is plenty of things that can revenge it, but if we do position on the few things that we can pick a KO on, and even if Ursuline gets one or two, I think it really opens up a Great Tusk endgame where it goes absolutely insane. So, I think that's really nice. Ghost Resists are also abysmal on Danny's team. We have Furret and Shiftry, which do not appreciate Cerule Edge. I think Cerule Edge can do a ton of work in this matchup. Again, especially if Sun boosted, some things are really going to get beaten down on. Um, Bitter Blade plus Poltergeist looks really, really strong in this matchup. Empo is going to be great in this game. It is the best wake check in the metagame. It, it just simply is. So Wake is almost effectively just gone in this game. That plus Shaman should actually check the Sun offense very, very well outside of Pokemon like Charizard, which is why I really think that from Danny's side, a more offensive Charizard should come um, to try and break through that conventional defensive core. I think that Empo, Shaman, and Dragology all do really, really well together though here um, and can really put on a ton of pressure on Danny's team in particular. And then maybe looking for some kind of healing wish in the back, whether it be for Gardevoir, um, if that ends up coming as like a Scarfing variant or just any variant in general, or even from the Shaman. If we could healing wish up either Luna or more than likely the Tusk if we have to use a little bit more defensively into like Lycanroc, I think that's a really clutch aspect um, and a way to keep it healthy and be able to use it throughout the game to break for itself, to pivot in for itself, and then kind of come back and get a second life 
and do a ton of damage. I think that this matchup can definitely be one on both sides, but I am going to go Uzi here just because I think the double ground offense is just too much for Danny's team to handle. Um, as long as he can deal and pivot around the sun well, which I think he does have a good sun matchup in Pokemon like the Empoleon, Shaman, and Jigalchi, I think he's going to be in a pretty good spot. So I'm going to go Uzi here. Then lastly, we have Viz versus Vivid here in another really, really fun matchup. Now, from Viz's side, I think the combination of, like, Spadef Abe and Spadef Tinglu just match up so well into Vivid's team. A lot of his offense, those special breakers, those uh, top three in particular, in the Kren, Goldango, and Chiyu, especially Chiyu and Goldango, they just... They hate having to play into Annihilate Tinglu, and that's what Viz has as a really solid core on his team. I think um, getting up hazards as well with Tinglu or Glamora, they're basically infinite in this game, right? And what I mean by that is while Vivid does have two hazard, you know, two spinners in this game and a defogger, they don't do so well, right? So Reggie Lucky is a spinner, loses to the hazard setter, and Tinglu. Cyclozar never gets a spin off while Ape exists. It just never does. It cannot pressure it. Ape always comes in, either eats up the hit and gets a Rage Fist boost, or it keeps the hazards, um, or it just blocks the rapid spin. Either way, you're in a pretty good spot if you're um, Viz in that scenario. And there's also like a random defog Cleavor, but the likely pivot into Cleavors could be something like Ape, and if you give that thing a Defiant boost, have fun switching in. You just don't switch in. And if you want a U-turn, get off negligible chip on the four times resist, once again, boosting the Rage Fist. So, I think that um, the combination of Annihilate Tinglu just puts a ton of pressure on Vivid's team. The combo of Fire plus Fighting also looks really solid, so I think something like an Armor Rouge can really put in a lot of work offensively against Vivid's team. And then Jolteon looks incredibly obnoxious as well. Again, the hazards that go up in this game, plus Jolteon pivoting around, um, and then plus things like Annihilate, Tinglu, Corviknight potentially, Glamora putting in a ton of work. Um, the Dragonite also looks very strong potentially with like a Dragon Dance variant. Um, I really do think that Viz's offense looks pretty incredible in this game. Vivid needs to overload Viz's team like crazy. And what I mean by that is, like we said, something like Tinglu and Annihilate, particularly Tinglu, are going to check a lot of your offense. So we need to use that offense to force in Tinglu often, as, as often as humanly possible. Again, something like a Lava Plume um, Chiyu or Ruination set to really, really put a ton of pressure on that uh, Tinglu is going to be really nice for something like a Scarf Goldango, which seems really solid here. That's going to outspeed a plus one D-Knight and also nuke something like the Annihilate, which really puts on a ton of pressure on your team. And there's not great Ghost Resist other than the Tinglu. So if we can chip down the Tinglu with something like our Chiyu, which is going to be the main switch into it, um, that's going to be really nice. We can really whirl things down, and then Greninja can hopefully come in and clean up the game a little bit later on. Otherwise, though, I go pretty much mono boots here. I go boots on pretty much everything besides like a Scarf Gold Dango, because you're not getting hazards away. We already said it, they're infinite in this game. Now, it is a downside not really being able to run other items, because we're missing out on item slots, but I think that's better than taking Rock, Spike, T-Spike every other turn, and your whole team dying in 15 turns, because we don't have a viable way of getting rid of said hazards. I think that Cleavor, while I did mention that it kind of does, you know, struggle into the ape, it forces a ton of progress. There is the option of dual wing beat, which will to it kill most ape variants. So if you can catch that thing on the switch in with a dual wing beat, or just you turn enough to chip it down in a range of a dual wing beat, that's going to be very solid for yourself as well. I think overall, Vivid's going to need to play very offensively in this game to gain any kind of traction before uh, Viz kind of just whittles everything down and sets up hazards and whirlwinds everything around and starts vaulting and U-turning and whittling everything to where something like Ape can win, something like Dragonite, or even something like Jolteon can clean up on its own. Because Terrorized Jolteon wins if something like a Bomb Snow doesn't come. And it's not like a Bomb Snow is a great Pokemon either because it just gets vaulted on and then Armor Rouge comes in and then you have to go, oh no, is he going to click a Fire move? Is he going to click the Focus Blast that hits my Bomb Snow? but also blows up my Chiyu Greninja Cyclozar, um, what is he going to do? Like, it's it's a really tough position for Vivid, um, and while I do think he has the tools to win, I am going to take Viz in this matchup. Alrighty, y'all, that is going to be week three of SPL Draft Notes. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Let me know if you think I'm tripping on any of my matchup analysis. Let me know what your favorite game from week two is, and you're most excited you are for whatever... What game you're most excited for week three? So I'm stumbling all over my words. I'm trying to record this before work. Um, so we're kind of rushing through. Uh, again, give me your pick for the week down below. I'm really curious to see. And uh, yeah, with that being said, I really appreciate y'all you know, taking the time out of your day to watch. And uh, drop a like. So if you're new, see you guys in the next one. Later.